Okay, so I think we can get started. So yeah. good evening, uh, good evening slash afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this series of lectures uh, that uh, Kuma is organizing together with us, Yala Project. So a joint, uh, uh, a joint greeting both from uh, Sarajevo and from uh, Palestine, uh, from Nablus today. So um, I'm just seeing if we have like, okay, I think we can just start because we waited some five minutes and latecomers will, will uh, join us uh, during, during uh, the, the lecture. Uh, so, but I would like to thank you all for uh, being here tonight, so this afternoon, and um, we really much uh, hope that you will enjoy the lecture and also uh, that uh, you are warming up for uh, some nice question time. So, uh, we are approaching towards the, the end of our lecture, our series, so uh, uh, tonight we have with us uh, Dima Maikari. Uh, that is uh, the fourth of five lectures. And uh, so tonight uh, she is going to uh, uh, talk to us about uh, trailing the uh, Shirkosian's uh, material culture from the Caucasus to the Levant. And uh, so Dima is an architect, a planner and a researcher. Uh, she has obtained a master's degree in media architecture from the Bauhaus Universität Weimar. Um, as a, a DAAD scholar in 2018 and a diploma in applied science of architecture from Damascus University in 2010. So very nicely hybrid uh, formation. This is what we like. Uh, her yeah. work focuses uh, on the cultural, social, political and economic impact of media and cultural techniques on urban and architectural space in practice and research. During her inter interdisciplinary master studies, she conducted media anthropology research on circassian architecture uh, and urban heritage. So I guess that is pretty much the, tonight's focus. Uh, she also took part in organizing conferences and workshops uh, on the topic of post-war cities and later uh, co-founded the Syrian lab for virtual urban planning uh, called uh, Sivaloop, uh, which uh, we are very, very curious about. Anyhow, we will maybe talk about it uh, later another day. Uh, so. And uh, if I may add to this, if I'm not wrong, uh, Dima, you are uh, 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 Circassian Syrian, correct? As an origin. Um, half Circassian, half Kurdish Syrian, yes. So oh, that's fantastic. So yeah. <laughs> you're perfectly fitting this series. So Dima, the floor is yours. Thank you very Thank much you. for being here. Thank you so much for this overwhelming intro. So I'm going just to, to uh, go ahead with with the uh, with the topic, so I'm. I did this research as part of my master thesis when I was doing my my master thesis in media architecture, and it was about the the, the notion of motion and architecture migration. But I realized that there were other layers, not only the mo motion of migrants, but other layers to it. So I'm going to present it today in four in four motions. The first one is the the the, uh, the motion of migration. So I'm going to, so, so there is no place called Circassia on the map right now found. You can find it on maps prior to the 19th century. It was broadly repeatedly named. And at the time, Circassians were the, the term used to describe the tribes of the biggest indigenous ethnic group, uh, the Adigea, who were inhabiting the, the north of the Caucasus. The historical Circassia was a term used to designate the Circassian territories, and it occupied the approximately about 100,000 kilo square kilometers, roughly a quarter the size of the whole Caucasus. It made it the largest territory in the region and the population of approximately 1.7 million by the 17th century. Since the 18th century, however, it was the colonial interest to many great powers at the time, mainly British, Ottoman, and the Russian empires. And this is illustrated in this 
comic map of war was during the Carminian War. And I do like this map a lot because it actually illustrates how the Circassian territories within their biggest extent from the Capsian Sea to the Black, uh, to the to the Black Sea in the West. And because of this location, the Circassians were, were subjected to several waves of migration and, and movement because of several reasons. And that actually, also, it's now in this map, it's called Circassia, but it was never a state. It was never a, a central or stable state. And the reason for that were first the the climate, the climate, they were, they had a very short agricultural uh, season. They had a lot of famines if the, if the spring was late or the, the, the autumn was too early. And also the second reason was related to this, to, to the location near the west, uh, uh, to, near in the Black Sea to the west, because they sev severed a lot of raids. And, and those raids were the main reason for them, were the, the captive of humans, to be sold in slave markets in the Middle East and Europe. And they had to always abandon their homes when there is danger to rebuild again, either after the danger has passed or move totally to a new different place. This transport of people, in addition to the spread of, uh, of, of plagues, exhausted the, the, the circassian population and it paralyzed them to the, from the ability of to have, a, to have a unified and stable states. And therefore they were divided to more or less several tribes living in a semi-migratory life, raising herds of sheep and cattle. Now from the Middle Ages to the, up to the 17th century, when it comes to the relationship with the Russians, the relation with the Russians was mainly peaceful and quiet, especially for the west side of the Circassians, the Kabardai. They had a peace treaty, all of that ended by the 17th century when Peter the Great had a territorial, saw the, 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 uh, the, Cox, West, the North Caucasus as a territory yet to be conquered as part of his vision to conquest Iran. Especially that because the Circassian territory was a buffer zone, was blocking the, the free movement of Russian troops to newly at that time, uh, areas of influence in Georgia and, and Mania. And, the, and also, which at that point, point was seen as to be serving as a base for the further expansion into Iran and India. And also the other reason was because, because the Circassians were giving harbor to the deserters from the Russian troops, that also was problematic to, to have a coherent military plan. The, the, the Russian historian Vasily put it very well. He simply described them as unconquered tribes blocking the path through the Caucasus Mountains. And there is the need to compel these people and, and because they interfere with the communication and that if the system of peace and gift doesn't work, then the path of war, regardless of how many victim, victims will be the way. So the Circassian Russian War considered have begun in 1763 and to be ended in 1864. By, by, 1806, uh, by 1826, the, the eastern part of Circassians, the Circassian, the Kabardai was totally conquested by the Russians, making the Kabardai, the Kabardai either refugees by the, within the eastern tribes or in the Ottoman Empire. The war became what later focused on the eastern, to, uh, east, uh, the western coastal tribes, which they made their last stand in May, in the 21st of May, 1864, five miles from the current location of the coastal city of Suchi. After the Circassian surrenders, the Russian expelled the majority of the surviving Circassian to the Ottoman Empire via ships. Many people died from uh, epidemics spreading among the, uh, the crowds at the ports of, deported and, uh, of the deport departure and arrival, when, uh, while others perished at the sea when some ships caught fire and sank. It's estimated that more than 1.5 million were the ones who were forced to immigrate, and only 1.1 million were eventually settled in the Ottoman Empire. Only a small group of one, uh, 150,000 remained in the Caucasus, and the date, 21st of May, became the Circassian Day of Sadness. Now, around half of the refugees 
at the Ottoman Empire were uh, resettled in the central Ottoman, uh, Anatolia, while the other half were resettled in the Balkans. And that was part of the part of the Ottoman um, demographic forced demographic change. They wanted to have more Muslims in in the Balkans. However, the latter group were again driven from their new homes in in the Balkans by the Russian troops in 1877 and 1878 after yet another uh, Russian circulation war. Those who were forced to immigrate further they made their way into the Levant in Syria, Japan, and uh, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. And in the beginning, the Ottoman, uh, uh, the, Ottoman um, the Ottoman authorities and officials were instructed to block the refugee movement into the cities. They only wanted them to be, to be resettled within villages and also to be resettled as uh, one circassian family for every five Turkish families, so they could uh, speed up the process of integration. However, due to the large number of refugees, that was uh, the, uh, the the villagers were unable to handle that. And finally, the, many circassians were given land to resettle on where empty land would be fine, and that was where the the the, the land was occupied by nomadic cultures, by the, the Bedouin and the Turkmen in Central Anatolia, and the Bedouin in, in Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. And they were instructed to give them land and to give them building materials so they can uh, start rebuilding new homes. Now, for that was, uh, this is the map more or less after the resettlement where the, the situations were, were set, where what could be found in, in various locations and in various densities. And for five generations, they have been separated, of course, and they had to struggle to, to keep up their cultural practice and their identity, especially like in Syria, the situations in Syria were yet to driven away from their homes in 1967 by the Israeli uh, when they conquered uh, the Golan Heights and basically destroyed 10 out of 12 uh, circassian villages and the Kunaitra city that had around 50% of its population were circassian. In Jordan, there was also very rapid urbanization for the villages where they lived. And in, in Russia, they were several times also uh, forced to move again during the, the Stalin time, during the, uh, the, the beginning of the Soviet uh, Union. So, for that sense, the situation, that struggle of giving the identity took a new shape with the arrival of social media. Because basically the, 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 the situation, Russian war and the deportation of circassian from the homeland was, uh, was a global level event. It was reported extensively in, in Western media. And many travelers and diplomats made their way into the circassian territories to, to document the circassian way of life. So you had, you had a lot of documentation of the, of the culture of, of their economy, of the material culture, and there was emphasis on the clothes, daily culture, and portraits for people, and sometimes the dwellings. And those visual lit uh, lit literary art on the circassians were remained preserved and documented in archival museums. However, oh, sorry, yeah. Digital archiving and having them, uh, 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 having them published online and the hyperlink of social media transferred the, that content because it became basically an intangible culture heritage. People started uh, posting those photos, sharing them, having uh, online archives on Facebook and online groups sharing those uh, among each other. And this is where my research came in. Because I was able to collect, to have a histor historiographical research of these documents. I, I was able to collect around 750 visual media sources and around 600 written documents about the circassian culture. It is important to note that most of, uh, much of those documentation was produced by foreign scholars, and they are defined by deep-rooted orientalist and archaeological approaches. So it was the, the 
chronological uh, analysis of those documents was necessary to investigate the, the accuracy of the historical and political context of each of these sources. So in this diagram, you can see how I, I made this timeline of how, how they are, uh, uh, the documentation went through on history and you can see the peak on the, on this side, I don't know if you see my mouse, this was during the, the circulation and Russian war in the diaspora and then documentation went really low afterwards. On the other hand, in the diaspora, the documentation was very high after the, the migration and also went lower, but not totally, uh, not as low as, as in, in the Caucasus. Both of them has a huge hype because of the social media on one hand. On the other hand, it was the 2014 Olympics in Sochi, the Winter Olympics that at that time, segregation wanted their, uh, their culture to be acknowledged and they were having, uh, act, uh, having uh, activities demanding that this is a remix made on the land of genocide and their culture should be recognized uh, in, in those Olympics. So, uh, sorry, yeah. So by situating the documentation within diverse fabrics of their historical and political events, we can understand the motives and the memories and the stories they tell better than actually just brushing through them. And afterwards, I conducted a historical comparative analysis to further the, to, to understand the evolution of the daily lives, especially when it comes to architecture. This resulted in, uh, in identifying key elements of our circassian architecture and explore what had changed and what had not in the tradition of architecture in each period and in each location. Which brings me to the third motion is the, 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 the motion of typology within a different geographical location and different, uh, uh, different times. So, First, before the Circassian Russian Wars, the main economic activities were uh, pastoral and agricultural in nature. And this is, this is a main thing, this is an illustration that I like because it's made by a Dutch, Dutch traveler and it's for a windmill. It's the only one that I ever found for a windmill and always found it funny that there's a Dutch painter, he only painted uh, the only painting for a windmill in the Caucasus. So, and the agricultural activities were uh, based on the collective ownership of land and everyone farmed. However, the differences in between who, who is richer and uh, between the more rich and the more poor uh, members of the community was not whether they, they farmed or not, or whether they, they had uh, livestock, but it was about the number and, and of the livestock. So, as I mentioned, however, because of the harsh climate and because of the safety reasons, that was, education did not practice agriculture for a very long time and on a consistent level. They were always forced, forced into live in migration and mobility to find raising herds and sheep and cattle. And in the light of that, um, lack of central authority, the, the life of education revolved around the village, the out. That was the main center of the authority and the main center of the social life. And that village-centric mentality and culture had a very literal form in, in the early stages of education architecture, illustrated by this early illustration for the villages that were built in the in the east side of, of Circassia. They, were, they are done by the, uh, the French traveler Jean Petit. He draws sketches of plants and the general view of an usual, unusual settlements taking a round shape. The settlements would stretch to be, uh, be around half the size of today's a football, uh, football field. The houses were built next to each other, wall to wall in a circle. In the center, an inner, of the, uh, an inner circle of small buildings were used for animals' husbandry as horses and dogs. The doors of each house faced the outside of the main circle, uh, main round wall, and each house had a fireplace. It's also noted by several other 
uh, travelers like the tra Turkish tra traveler Kelip as well. So the, those settlements, as I said, were in the Eastern side and, and the Institute of Archaeology of Russian Academy in the 90s, they analyzed area photographs and found around 200 ancient settlement sites built on, the single, on this single architectural plan. However, this circular settlement was only familiar to the Eastern tribes, the Kabardai, and this limited the uh, limited use would be a result of the, first of all, the, the, the uh, predominantly the, 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 the economic activity was, uh, uh, was animal husbandry over architecture, uh, agriculture. And at the end of the, the 13th century, the political situation allowed this, the Kabardai to have, to build those communes in open fields because it was more or less safe because they were deep in the mountains and they didn't suffer a lot of raids. Also, they were in, uh, in a peace treaty with the Russians. So, but later on, for safety reasons, the more com uh, common architecture settlements were, uh, were, were unstable and needed to be transferred from one place to another. This semi-nomadic way of life, preparedness for immediate move and limited, uh, limit, limited the building of the round commune and the circulation needed to build, sorry, uh, yeah, and the circulation needed to build less developed uh, circulation houses and traditional dwelling called Adigawuna, which illustrated in this in this diagram. That that dwelling started to, to emerge more uh, more frequently, with roofs that can be dismantled and taken away from when necessary. Therefore, walls were not connected tight, tightly to the roof. And joints are and, and they are joints only and the joints are only coated with clay from the outside. This necessary building skill can be indirectly mentioned in an iconic uh, 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 saying in in the in, in Kabardai, who doesn't know how to know that it's like dismantling and reassembling a house as it's dissembling and resembling a house is something super easy and everyone should know. A long rectangle layout with a single chamber or one roll of multi chambers was the most common for the traditional circulation adigawina. Similar to the circular commune, the entrance of this dwelling would be open to the outside. This quality was of easy access was believed to be a sign of hospitality and openness. And the shape of the and the materials of the roof were connected to the, uh, to the natural and clim uh, climactic conditions of the area. So an area of heavy rainfall, the, the roof would be steeper, while in areas of less rain, the roof would be flat or sloping. Both peaked roof and flat roof were made of reed and, uh, and, and straw. And the roof mainly rested on a special strong beams that were connected, but not so tightly to the walls, to the walls, to provide possible detachment in further when dismantled, uh, dismantling of the house is necessary. Additionally, one, one, one other, uh, one other uh, important element of the Adigawina is the the front porch. Many dwelling would have a porch extending along in uh, its front. The porch and the dwelling were designed as one single entity with a front porch underlining the entrance of the chambers. Also another uh, significant element is the fireplace called Wajak. Uh, was, was another unique element and it was constructed also as one unit with, it was also as contracted as one unit with the house with one fireplace in each chamber. The roof would have an opening for the, um, for the fireplace and the fireplace opening, uh, the fireplace would be located around 1.5 meters 
above the above the floor and it would have cone shaped pipes that would extend up on the roof now after the end of the circassian uh, russian wars the the remaining the remaining circassians with several villages in the Caucasus. The houses remain populated from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the of uh, 1930s. The dwelling uh, in these villages took more steadier form because there was no need for dismantling the house anymore. And <clears throat> uh, yeah, and later on the 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 flat roof became also more common, more and became more earthly. And the conical shape of the fireplace and the porch extending along the front remained a distinguished uh, feature in many dwellings. And even after the, the, imperial, the imperial Russian policy and also the Soviet uh, collectivism policy forced the desiccation to move again and build new villages, the desiccation built houses in and new villages with similarities to that to the to the original circassian dwelling winner and even it extended to become a multi-story dwelling and multi-family dwelling now the the layout and the fireplace and the um the 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 whole the typology of these houses of course were not moved as houses and as uh, with the people who moved to the middle east the people moved to the Middle East and they started building new houses. And of course, they started building houses similar to the one they had uh, in the original homeland. There were other, there were new, uh, sorry. Uh, they they had, uh, sorry. So, so in Syria and in, in Palestine, stone dwellings started to appear using local stones available in the area they settled in. And they were also influenced, influenced by local construction when regarding the details of the windows and the use of brick materials in the roofs. The roofs of the house in both Syria and, and Palestine were steep. And the layout of the multi-chamber with the, an extending porch uh, 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 above the entrance remained the main layout. This layout even extended to other concrete uh, con construction. This is a school in the Golan Heights in Syria and actually shows how this typology even started to become even beyond the typology of housing. In Jordan, however, the circassians arrived first in inside the caves of the old Roman ruins of Amman and Jarosh. And for the construction, they started, they they even started using the, the sorry, uh, they started using stones from the Roman ruins to lay out their settlements as well and to the, on the construction. And, they were using the using of carts for transport was kind of a, their unique feature in the region, and that is, affected the spatial layout of their villages. The routes of the became wider between the house, and and that was affected the 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 general view of the settlement, the circassian settlements. Unlike the Arab settlements, where they were more compact. And the agriculture, the, the houses would be compact together, agricultural areas would be outside the village. The circassian villages would have fences separating each house with the agricultural uh, area within the same, the same plot. And also, of course, I mean, uh, in this image, of course, we see several, uh, several archaeological sites. This is the Omerim, Omerim Mosque that later become the, uh, the Husseini Mosque. And here we, we see the, the house inside the Sabil Huriyat in Amman from, from a more bird view uh, perspective. Similarly, also in Wadi there, there were also settlements built uh, by the by the circassians. 
And by, by looking at this chronologically, we can see basically what how the, the circadian architecture evolved and what changed and what not and what has been transport uh, trans uh, what transferred from one location to another and through time. Now this was all done looking at images, which bring me to the first motion. At that point, I wanted to put this into more spatial experience and or actually see what I have saw in. In, in the images is reflected in the oral history of segregation communities. And for obvious reasons, I couldn't film in Syria or, or Palestine. So I went to Amman and this is Amman. This is a, a view from the castle. Basically it's where this image is taken and this one. So I thought like, okay, there's this layer of history with a lot of segregation houses, I'm going, try to find one house in good condition and film it and talk to you about it. Well, it was easier said than done because basically those houses were never designated as cultural heritage. So basically they slowly were, were either neglected and, and destroyed or they, they, were, they were destroyed and something else was rebuilt instead of them. And I was talking to a lot of people on the circulation community, asking them to take me to a circulation house. They would tell me I would take it to a circulation house and I would end up being in a three-bay house built for a circulation family, but is not a circulation house. So, and of course, I met a lot of interesting people. I met a lot of researchers who we discussed the phenomena of, of the identity and, and the architectural integration and what, what does it mean for the circulation community and got out of photos from our, some archives. This is uh, from the archive of uh, architect Kemal Raluca. He photographs those uh, houses before they were destroyed in, in uh, some of them in Naur and others in Wadi Seir. And finally, luckily I was able to find a house in Wadi Seir that was in a good condition. The exterior of the house at least remained having the, the features that, uh, that make it look like an Adigawina, maybe some changes in the interior. So the Wajak was, the fireplace was not there anymore. And it also served some mysteries for me. For example, this uh, this stone that was in the backyard of the house is actually the owners of the house didn't know it. It was well, the person who showed me the house told me it was used for for maintaining the roof. So, so yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Oh, thank you very much. That was really beautiful. And uh, personally, I, I really learned a lot. Um, thank you because it, uh, although like the Circassian migration to the Levant was anticipated both by, uh, in, in these lectures by Daun Chati and uh, uh, also by, um, um, uh, the, by Isa Blumi, but you offered really, a, really another another perspective that is a, a, um, a close up, and uh, that is re it really mm -hmm. humanizes a lot what we mm -hmm. previously learned from uh, Dawn Chati and Isa Blumi that we're more talking about like major movements of people or like zooming up. Uh, to that and uh, I think uh, it's easier also to relate and also I think it's um, um, uh, it's kind of surprising how uh, such a relevant part of, of human history is not taught not in uh, in Europe and uh, not even in the Levant and that's really a thing that we should discuss I think I hope we can discuss uh, further in the future because um, I think the perspective on in general on the world is changing and also on uh, on uh, nations not in terms of state but in terms of groups of people that share the same origins and something should change also should be reflected also in the curriculum of what we teach and how we teach it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I would like, first of all, to thank you really, really much. It was amazing. And I would like also to uh, anticipate to the audience that uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, your documentary on... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I can share the links with you. It's, yeah, it's on YouTube. Great. So on YouTube, you can find the entire documentary of uh, uh, Dima Meikari's uh, research on uh, on uh, Circassian displacement and uh, the material co culture. So, and I see, thank you for sharing the link. She just uh, dropped it also in the uh, in this chat, but uh, uh, any one of you who would be interested, please also approach us in case you, you lost the, the link. So I, was, I would like to see if uh, we have someone from uh, the audience that would like to ask something about uh, uh, or has uh, comments to uh, Dima's lecture. So we are, I think like many of us are fasting. Yeah, so. I've assumed that, yeah, it's totally <laughs> fine. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, like I, I think that now as we are approaching the iftar time, some of us are, are not really able to articulate a question. Also, I think um, your, your presentation was uh, was uh, it, it reminded me also of uh, the lecture that we had yesterday uh, on migration in Palestine that was so rich of information that it's not easy to ask a question actually, uh, which is a good thing because it was immensely rich. Uh, so, but I, I, I will just uh, take the advantage of, uh, uh, of this little <laughs> gap to ask, um, first of all, like, as as yourself being an um, an inheritor of the Circassian culture and the Circassian community, uh, how you also how, how you see uh, the Circassian community now nowadays, and uh, and what if um, let's say how do you uh, preserve your culture or if you we were discussing recently about the fact that uh, one of uh, 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 the, the scholars that are participating to our workshop is, is uh, investigating the, the uh, community from Bosnia who migrated to Palestine that eventually merged so much that many of them do not even uh, uh, distinguish themselves from the Arabs uh, mm -hmm. and have become completely like Arab Palestinians. And I would like to ask you instead what is the state of art of on the Circassian community uh, also because uh, you mentioned um, the, the protest on, in Sochi that were not covered by uh, the media, not very well, at least in the West. No, not very well. I mean, it's, uh, well, the Circassians are like, you know, one of the, one of the, the main weakness of the Circassian that it's the, the information has this ecosystem among the Circassians. So how did I know about the Circassian protest, uh, yeah, protesting on Facebook? Some other Circassians who know would add me to a Facebook group who would start sharing and then, you know, other Facebook groups. But then, I mean, I'm a Circassian, they would think that, okay, as a group called Circassians in Germany, you would not add no Circassians. And then that would create this ecosystem of information being shared among Circassians. Like, for example, I mean, when, and this is, this is a different situation, but when in New Zealand, the attack on the mosque happened, there are two Circassians who died in that attack. I mean, no one would, when they are saying the nationalities would say, because they are, nationalities are Syrian, Syrian Circassians, but well, how would I know? Because other Circassians on Facebook were boasting and, they were saying we are, you know, this is sad and this is this is a sad day for the community. So one of the things that I say that as I mean, it's it's kind of a point of there is a point of uh, uh, interesting point that Circassian, whenever they are, they always find a way to communicate. So in in the Netherlands, there are like no no more than four hundred, and still they would have an association that they do activities in the U.S. There are four thousand of them. And they also have an association. So in any community when the, where there have been a gathering, you always found some sort of way they, they were communicating. But I think communicating to the others was always a point of weakness. 
And also the, there has been a disinterest by the others. Like basically the Sikhian genocide was really very well, well covered by the media during the 19th century. That at some point I read that there, you wouldn't open, you wouldn't pick up a newspaper that wouldn't be talking about it. But at the time, because mainly British empire were interested in backing the Circassians because they wanted to block the Russian interest in India and Iran. But when they had that, you know, uh, they were giving guarantees that that would not be the case. It just went dead silent. So, and then the interest in the situation in the Middle East also was kind of also the colonial interest in the region and also how the, the in many, uh, by many scholars, it's always that they are different and also racially for the Europeans when they are walking around and they say a village where everyone there is white, that was for them something something different. So, so yeah, I mean, how I see it today, I think I'm, I'm not I'm not sure. Like there is activities always, but they are always again in this ecosystem. The yeah. Jews do is it some I, I confess I'm really ignorant on this, but is it something that has you see like um kind of um a parallel, for example, with the Kurdish people? No, I would think the Kurdish people has more territorial claim. Not like yeah. there is there is the they are in one territory and they're like more or less and there's this divide ethnicity between four countries. So there is something more within the territory. The thing with circulation is that, you know, like even not like the Armenians, because even the Armenians have Armenia, like also it's way smaller than it used to be, and they lost a lot of territory, but still they have a territory. The circulations, however, the few places in Russia, they are still like not the, the majority of population in those cities like Nashik and, and, and Maikop, like maybe up to 50% of the population. And in all other places they are divided. So it's, I wouldn't say there are a lot of there. And that's why more, more or less I can say circassian activities are always not seen as something dangerous. That's mm -hmm. why, like, you know, mm. that's why also you, you don't cover something you don't see, like you either cover something because you have an instrumental need, you want to use it for some reason, or you see it as a dangerous thing. And in the case of circulations, it's neither. They cannot anymore be any instrument to anyone in a way because they don't have a unified state. They don't have a political power. And also they are no danger to anyone. So in kind of being live and let live situation. Hmm. But and, and I have just one last question, uh, but I would like first to see if someone meanwhile has thought about uh, something to ask in, in case uh, from the audience, please you use the, the button raise hand so that we can see that uh, you would like to ask something. But as, as one last thing, I would I wanted to ask in this, you were mentioning that now the Circassian, Circassian communities around uh, the world uh, uh, continue gathering and they have community kind of community centers or something like this. So on that side, do, do you, uh, uh, I don't know if you visited uh, many of those centers, but if you noticed or which kind of features uh, like uh, on, on the side of material culture, so um, interiors, decoration, architecture, whatever um, is. Oh, well, sadly, the only one that has it is the one that is in Palestine in the occupied territories. So it's the only one that preserved the architectural. And again, I mean, this is something that's related to where the Israelis did not have that much hostility to two villages with 4,000. I mean, they, they really would not do any damage and basically they're invisible. Mm -hmm. So again, the live, let live situation. And yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the ones in, in Jordan, basically the, the Circassian so, uh, Charity Association is the oldest charity organization in Jordan. It's the first one. And it has been like, I think, uh, and also it started in Amman and had other branches. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the architecturally speaking, no, they are just in, in Jordan, they were just 
normal buildings. The one in Palestine is the only one that has uh, has a historical uh, <laughs> historical value. Well, in that case, if you are curious to know more about that, or if you need someone field working for you, definitely Yala Project is at your complete disposal. And that would we can be, great. be your, your eyes and ears and, uh, and uh, hands for sketching anytime. This is definitely part of our, uh, of our endeavor. And also like we are very much, uh, we have a common goal of like having somehow history rewritten with the with the voices of uh, the, uh, let's say <laughs> bottom up voices definitely because the, like uh, let's say the official history left us out so many things and also so many people so that would be great so I think that uh, if now I also see that someone just joined the session and uh, in that case uh, I would like to to repeat that uh, the lecture was uh, uh, was recorded so in case uh, if, if Dima agrees uh, we will later on uh, uh, publish at least uh, some part of the contents uh, uh, so perhaps you can catch up with it later and if we do not have uh, uh, questions from the floor I would like first of all to thank Dima very very much because it was really you. great and you did a, a fantastic job uh, seriously um, um, I really mean it and uh, uh, I would say that I, I hope to see more of this of this work because it's worthy. Definitely, it's really worthy. And I really learned so much. I, I didn't know anything. So <laughs> thank you so okay. much. Sure. Uh, I, although I try to read, but like on the architectural side, I, I was really amazed by certain typologies that I didn't know. Uh, it's amazing. So thank you very much. You. I would like to thank the audience for being here. And I thank would like, of course, to thank uh, uh, Kuma for uh, hosting us uh, for this lecture series.